style. For March, we'll be considering five competitions of historic proportions. Each week, we'll look at a couple or more of our favorite monarchs, and you will vote on the winner. You can vote anytime during the month. Please, please follow me on social media so you can participate and vote. I'm at at Shake Up History on Instagram and Twitter and Carol Ann Lloyd Shake Up History on Facebook. Our first competition is about the very foundation of the monarchy. Which monarch do you think contributed more to the essence of kingship in early Britain, King Arthur or Richard the Lionheart? Those monarchs take the field on Wednesday, March 3rd, and you choose the winner. Next, a rosy battle, or should I say, a rosy war. We've looked at the Wars of the Roses before, but this time we're pitting king against king. You make the choice. Who deserved to win the Wars of the Roses? Henry the Sixth or Edward the Fourth? They both had at least one victory over the other, but now it's time for a final round. Your vote chooses the big rosy winner. Then it's on to the Tudors. The big guy himself asked this question in 1537 in the Whitehall mural. Did Henry the Seventh or Henry the Eighth contribute more to the Tudor dynasty and to England? Henry the Eighth answered that question, choosing himself, but I'm not willing to take his word for it. So what do you think? Which of the first two tutors made the most difference? Then, as it's Women's History Month, as well as March Madness Month and Monarch Madness Month, our final two contests will be between the queens. First off, a classic battle between cousins. Who was the more successful queen, Elizabeth I of England or Mary, Queen of Scots? Use whatever criteria you like and choose your winner. And finally, we can't end a royal rumble without a nod to the women whose lives redefined Henry VIII over and over and over and three more times. The six wives of Henry VIII changed England, changed Henry, and changed history. So, now you decide which wife had the most impact. Who changed Henry or England or history the most significantly? So, are you ready to rumble? Sometime in 1537, Henry VIII had Hans Holbein create a spectacular portrait of the Tudor dynasty up to that point. It covered a hall in Whitehall Palace, likely in the Privy Chamber. The king's parents, Henry VII and Elizabeth of York, are in the background, while Henry VIII and his current wife, Jane Seymour, are in the front. The portrait was a huge PR move for Henry, who by this time, had been on the throne for nearly 30 years with only two illegitimate daughters to show for it. It's thought Jane Seymour was pregnant at this time, but nobody knew the baby would be a healthy boy who would eventually outlive his father and inherit the throne. The reality was that Henry was on his third wife and still waiting for a son and heir. His health was starting to change as his jousting accidents were taking a heavy toll, and he was not able to ride and exercise as much as he used to. He was in his 40s and not getting any younger. But Henry was determined that his glory be celebrated. So right in the middle of the portrait is a stone altar with an inscription. The inscription begins, If you find pleasure in seeing fair pictures of heroes, then look at these. None greater was ever portrayed. Fierce is the struggle and hot the disputing. The question, does father, does son, or do both the preeminence win? So, Henry himself poses the very question we're considering here in Monarch Madness. Which King Henry did more for the Tudor dynasty, Henry VII or Henry VIII? Of course, Henry VIII being Henry VIII, he doesn't want to leave the answer to others. They might get it wrong. So he has the story go on. Quote, One ever withstood his foes and his country's destruction, finally giving his people the blessing of peace. But born to things greater, the sun drove out his counsels, his ministers worthless, and ever supported the just. And in truth, to this steadfastness, papal arrogance yielded when the scepter of power was wielded 
by Henry VIII, under whose reign the true faith was restored to the nation and the doctrines of God began to be reverenced with awe. Hmm. In case you somehow missed the fact that the image of Henry VII is tucked back into a corner, while the image of Henry VIII is larger than life, facing front, unnaturally strong and overpowering, given his age and the state of his health, in case you missed all of that, he's telling you flat out that he takes preeminence over his father. Yes, his father brought peace to the nation, but the son, well, there you have real greatness. He got rid of his father's bad ministers. He supported the just. He was so steadfast, the Pope yielded the scepter of power to him, and he restored the doctrines of God to the nation. So that's Henry VIII's answer. Me, me, me. But what is yours? Which Henry do you think did the most for the Tudor dynasty and Tudor England? Let's take a look at the legacies of each king. Henry VII. On the 7th of August, 1485, a weary man landed at Mills Bay in Wales. He was returning to his homeland after years of exile in Brittany and France. When he fled the country 14 years earlier, he had been accompanied by only his uncle and a few others. He had spent his exile on the run, attempting to avoid being sent back to England to become a prisoner of an unfriendly regime. Now he was back. Arriving with him were about 2,000 soldiers. They were hired for the job, not loyal followers. And some say they had to be bribed with ale and bread to even come ashore. They camped their first night at Dale to make preparations. Then they began their march across Wales, heading for England. This man, who had spent little time at the English court even before his exile, was now staking a claim for the throne of England. His name was Henry Tudor, and he was about to change history forever. Who was Henry Tudor, and how did he end up being the one to challenge Richard III for the throne? Henry was the son of Margaret Beaufort, descendant of John Beaufort, the illegitimate turned legitimate son of John of Gaunt. Royal blood? Yes. Clear line to the succession? Not exactly. But Henry, once called the, quote, only imp now left of Henry VI's blood, end quote, by Polydor Virgil, was the focus for nobles who were unhappy with the reign of Richard III. They joined Henry's side and, against all odds, the exile and his army of mercenaries and malcontents defeated the brilliant warrior Richard III and his royal forces at Bosworth Field. Henry Tudor became King of England. But becoming king and remaining king were two different things. To secure his reign, Henry Tudor created a narrative that put him on the throne the day before Bosworth and made Richard and his followers traitors fighting against the king. This set up a defense against, then he set up a defense against future Yorkist claims by marrying Elizabeth of York, uniting the houses of Lancaster and York, and ending the battle for the crown. And, by the way, eliminating any need for any future battles for the crown. He came up with a stunningly successful emblem to symbolize all of this, the Tudor Rose. In Henry's story, the complicated series of battles in the 15th century were actually a war of roses, red roses and white roses, symbolizing the houses of Lancaster and York. It wasn't called the Wars of the Roses for many years, but Henry VII first came up with the imagery, and then Shakespeare picked it up, and the legend took hold. Henry had to do a bit of maneuvering with the truth, as his family hadn't actually used red roses for an emblem, but he managed it. Then Henry VII stamped that Tudor rose all over London, and there it remains. The Tudor rose is literally carved into the English consciousness on buildings throughout the country. It remains an essential royal emblem to this day. You can see it in the Coronation Regalia. You find the Tudor Rose everywhere, from colleges at Cambridge, to pubs in London, to the coins people use every day. In addition to creating a story and a symbol, Henry managed to have two sons who survived infancy, something no other Tudor was able to do. Henry VII used his children to form alliances with the great houses of Europe. When Ferdinand and Isabella, the couple honored by the Pope as the Catholic monarchs of Europe, agreed to allow their daughter to marry into the Tudor family, it was a huge coup for the new dynasty. 
Henry also attempted to ease tensions with the Scots by having his daughter Margaret marry the King of Scotland. Even after the personal tragic tragedy of Arthur's death, which was a political problem as well, Henry VII had another son ready to become the heir. Henry VII's reign was challenged twice by Perkin Warbeck and Lambert Simnel. He put both rebellions down. Henry VII's lack of royal brothers and uncles and extended family meant he relied more on educated and trained counselors and less on the nobility. This had the effect of making the royal government more professional and less a matter of birth. He promoted and increased English trade with European ports. Through efforts that became more suspect and enormously unpopular in the later years of his reign, he doubled the state revenue. Henry VII also embarked on massive building programs. He built and refurbished numerous palaces, including Windsor Castle, Richmond Palace, and Greenwich Palace. He also refurbished Westminster Abbey and built the Henry VII Lady Chapel. The chapel is a masterpiece of medieval architecture and considered by many to be the crowning glory of the abbey. It includes an ornate, pendant-style, fan-vaulted ceiling. It was intended to be a shrine to the previous Lancastrian king, Henry VI. Henry VIII had hoped to have his predecessor canonized. When that didn't work, the chapel became the resting place for Henry VII and his family. He commissioned magnificent tombs for his mother, Margaret Beaufort, his wife, Elizabeth of York, and himself. So Henry VII certainly did a bit more than his son gave him credit for. Henry VIII. For the first ten years of his life, Prince Henry was the spare. He was raised in his mother's household. Then Arthur died in 1502, and Elizabeth of York died a year later. Henry was thrust into the role of an heir. He was not ever close to his father in the way Arthur had been, but he became the future. When Henry VIII inherited the throne in 1509, he came to the throne amid fanfare and rejoicing. For the first time in nearly a hundred years, it was the traditional passing of the crown from father to adult son without challenge or controversy. He quickly married Catherine of Aragon, his brother's widow, which was not a problem at that time. They were crowned together the 24th of June, 1509. There was every expectation that the new king and queen would have children and secure the succession for years to come. It must have been quite a surprise and a disappointment to Henry, Catherine, and the kingdom that 20 years later, the royal couple had produced only one living child, a daughter, Princess Mary was very popular among the people, but there had never been a successful reigning queen of England. Men were meant to rule. That was the pattern that had existed for hundreds of years. The only time a reigning queen had been tried was Matilda, and that led to years of civil war. Henry VIII knew providing a male heir was one of his primary responsibilities as king. Failing to provide for the succession meant failing, and Henry was not about to be considered a failure. He had already developed a plan to have a son now that Catherine was not able to have more children. He would marry again, and he'd already chosen his next wife, Anne Boleyn. In fact, Henry decided that the lack of a son must be a sign from God that he needed to make a change. Henry should not have married his brother's wife after all. He asked the Pope to annul his first marriage to Catherine, fully expecting a positive response. After all, dispensations and annulments were provided regularly at the time. Unluckily for Henry, the Pope was under the control of Catherine's nephew, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. And to keep Charles V happy, the Pope turned down Henry VIII. Henry was not a man who heard no easily, and in this case, he refused to hear it at all. He charged ahead, broke up with the Catholic Church and the Pope, and established himself as supreme head of the Church of England. His hand-selected Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, agreed that the marriage to Catherine of Aragon was void and the marriage to Anne Boleyn was absolutely in effect. That determination was followed by the coronation of a clearly pregnant Anne Boleyn in June 1533. Anne was the first person crowned since England had separated itself from papal jurisdiction, so it was an important event in many ways. Surprisingly for a queen consort, Anne was crowned with St. Edward's crown, something that had previously been saved for the monarch himself. 
It was the most revered object of the regalia, and its use during Anne's coronation may have been Henry's way of reinforcing her legitimacy as queen and the legitimacy of their unborn son, because of course it would be a son. It had been no small task for Henry to up in the country and convince his previously Catholic leaders and followers to form a new church. And Catherine of Aragon had been no help. She had resisted and she was popular. Many of the people sided with her and with Princess Mary. Some of his friends were refusing to support him. But all of this would be fine when Henry VIII's son was born. That would prove he'd been doing God's will all along, not simply changing wives. Anne had promised him a son. God was on his side. All would be well. Not so fast, Henry. God again said no, apparently, and Anne gave birth to a girl. This set Henry off on a marital merry-go-round for his time the rest of his reign. It's reported that when Francis I, Henry's sometime rival and sometime friend, heard that Henry was ending in a few years his marriage with fourth wife Anne of Cleves, he responded in astonishment, the queen that now is? So Henry VIII put the Tudor monarchy on the world map. He was the most married English king in history, a title he still holds. And speaking of wives, it was his marital misadventures that inspired Henry to start the Church of England. His religious reformation went only so far. Primarily, it meant Henry was the head of the church instead of the Pope, that he received the money in the land from the monasteries, and that he commissioned the printing of the Bible in English. What did this mean? It meant that Henry's sovereignty came from Parliament, which passed these laws, instead of from the Pope. That gave Parliament additional power. By redistributing the monastic lands, Henry oversaw the greatest change in land ownership since William the Conqueror in 1066. The man who had once worked so hard to earn the Pope's recognition as, quote, defender of the faith, basically ended the Pope's control of England. Henry extended his father's professional approach to government. Instead of filling his council with the highest levels of the aristocracy, Henry was open to men who worked to gain his favor. Thomas Wolsey, son of a butcher, was the king's first favored minister. When Wolsey fell from favor, he was followed by Thomas Cromwell, son of a blacksmith. These men were educated and worked extremely hard for the king. Furthermore, their lack of status meant they would never challenge the king's authority or make a play for his throne. And once they lost favor, Henry could easily dispose of them and move on to someone else. In 1540, the Privy Council came into its own in terms of governing power. So Henry's government operated with a cabinet of ministers instead of one very powerful man, other than the king himself, of course. Parliament continued to gain power during Henry's reign. So overall, over the course of Henry's reign, government moved away from a feudal power base into more of a functioning group of ministers. Another key contribution of Henry VIII was the Royal Navy, or his army by sea. One of Henry's most famous ships was the Mary Rose. He began construction just a year after coming to the throne, and it was completed in 1511. It's often said the ship was named after Henry's sister, Mary, but it's more likely it was named after the Virgin Mary and intended to reflect the power of the Tudor dynasty and of the Virgin. The Mary Rose was a 600-ton vessel that carried six or eight large guns. That meant it needed a state-of-the-art design to include gun ports. Legend has it that Henry insisted on this configuration and was especially proud of this ship as a result. The Mary Rose participated in several battles. This most famous ship was refitted in the later 1530s with extra gun ports. In 1545, the Mary Rose was part of the fleet fighting the French in the Battle of the Solent. Attempting to make a turn, the great ship tipped to one side. The gun ports were open, so when they dipped below waterline, the ship quickly flooded and went under. Only 35 of the 500 men aboard survived. The Tudors attempted to raise the Mary Rose, but they were unable to do so. The Mary Rose was located in 1971, and work began excavating the ship. It was finally raised in 1982, nearly 450 years after it was lost. Extensive conservation has recovered numerous items from the crew, and the Mary Rose now provides a fascinating glimpse into Tudor life and Henry VIII's great contribution. Henry's navy would provide the foundation of Elizabeth's success against the Spanish Armada. 
Henry also, Henry VIII also made co- important contributions to medicine. With all his own health problems, Henry was interested in medicinal treatments and is said to have made herbal remedies for himself and his closest advisors. By royal decree, he established a governing body to monitor apothecaries and physicians practicing in the realm. Henry enforced this by an act of parliament. The organization is now the Royal College of Physicians. This was an important step in medicine, becoming a matter of science. Like his father, Henry VIII embarked on building and renovation projects. Henry built Nonsuch Palace in Surrey. He started work six months after his son Edward was born. The name Nonsuch comes from the assertion the palace would be so grand that there was no such palace anywhere else in the world. Although he seemed delighted with his plans and the way they were carried out, Henry seems to visit Nonsuch only three times in his reign, twice in 1545 and once in 1547. Edward, whose birth was being celebrated by that building, showed no interest. When Mary became queen, she sold the palace to Henry Fitzalan, Earl of Arundel. Later, in the reign of Elizabeth I, Elizabeth and Dutch rebels signed the Treaty of Nonsuch at the palace. Philip II of Spain saw this as an act of war, and it contributed to the launching of the Spanish Armada. Another of Henry's building projects was his extensive renovation of Hampton Court Palace. Unlike Nonsuch, which was torn down by Barbara of Castlemaine, mistress of Charles II, Hampton Court Palace survives and offers visitors a stunning example of Tudor architecture and Tudor life. Henry transformed the palace into one of the most sophisticated places in all of England. After Henry was finished, Hampton Court, including tennis courts, still there, a bowling alleys, a park of more than 1,100 acres, a stunning royal chapel, which is still in use today, and an expansive kitchen you can visit. Henry VIII used Hampton Court Palace to demonstrate his magnificence and wealth in numerous ways. He collected tapestries. Nearly 2,500 tapestries are listed in the inventory taken at his death. The Story of Abraham series, commissioned in 1537 to commemorate Edward's birth, originally hung in the Great Hall of Hampton Court Palace. These were described by contemporaries as brightly colored with shining gold and silver threads and silk of all different colors. Henry's richly decorated palace with the latest features in architecture and hung with tapestries that glistened in the candlelight would have provided a perfect stage for the king to present himself as the epitome of grandeur and royal magnificence. With all of this, Henry seems to have burned himself into our collective consciousness. When then Prime Minister Tony Blair welcomed European leaders to London several years ago, he started his remarks by saying, quote, As Henry VIII said to his six wives, I won't keep you long. End quote. The image of Henry VIII, hands on hips and legs apart, is immediately recognizable, even 500 years after his death. Your turn to choose. So, what do you think? Was Henry VIII right when he claimed he did more than his father? Or did Henry VII actually do the most, despite not being as famous, or should I say infamous, as his son? Be sure to vote. You can reach me on Instagram or Twitter as at Shakeup History or on Facebook as Carol Ann Lloyd at Shakeup History. I'm also part of the Tudor Learning Circle, and you can find me there as Carol Ann Lloyd. You can also email Carol Ann at carolannlloyd.com or leave a comment in the podcast. However you like, I'd love to hear your vote. And next week, we're staying with the Tudors to look at those famous rivals, Elizabeth I of England and Mary, Queen of Scots. I can't wait. Thank you for playing Monarch Madness. Now, before you go, please take a moment to subscribe, leave a rating, and share with a friend. And I always love hearing what you think. Thank you so much. Be sure to make your voice heard. Vote for your favorite monarch at at Shakeup History on Instagram and Twitter and Carol Ann Lloyd Shake Up History on Facebook. And let's keep shaking up history together. Music.